Welcome to the Learning to Die podcast. I'm Ian Dunican. And I'm Kieran O'Regan. How do I live when I know I must die? We explore areas of philosophy, psychology, martial arts, culture, existential risk, history, society, religion, science, and anything else that seems of interest and relevance to answering that question. We can only hope that some of what we learn might be of benefit to you too. Namaste, sapiens. <laughs> Welcome back to the Learning to Die podcast. Today we are joined by Dr. Chris Lethby. And is it, did I pronounce that right, Chris? Is it Lethby or Lethby? Lethby. Lethby, excuse me. Yeah, yeah, no um, worries. I was doing radio this morning and before I did radio, the lady was telling me I spelled my name wrong. So there you go. <laughs> um, and then she goes, oh, there is an I in it. She was called me Ian Duncan. But it, lucky, oh, it was right. a, lucky, lucky it was a pre-record for the radio so she could go back and change it. And she goes, oh, yeah, there is an I in it. I was like, yeah, thank you for correcting my name after 43 years. But uh, anyway. Um, <laughs> all right. So today we are joined by Chris. And uh, there's probably going to be two different angles on this podcast, I think, uh, well, first of all, as a precursor and intro, you've heard Karen and I discuss uh, a lot about psychedelics and philosophy over the last few months. Now we have an actual expert. It's not two hairy apes like me and Karen talking about it. Uh, yeah. There'll be two kind of angles to this, uh, discussing Chris's book. I haven't read it because it only came out recently in Australia and it's in my queue. But Karen got it before I did in Ireland. And Karen has gone through it like the, uh, the honey monster and has been... M- delving into this book and he's got lots of questions today i've also had the great privilege of having lunch with chris and bending his ear for over an hour so uh karen will be uh taking the lead on a lot of questions here today so chris i suppose just as a bit of a background and intro do you want to give us just a, a quick background of uh where you grew up and you know your kind of educational background that led you to researching the philosophy of psychedelics yeah, sure. So I'm from Adelaide, South Australia. I was born in Adelaide and have spent almost all my life there. I moved to Perth, where I'm based now in um, Western Australia, about three and a half years ago. But um, I did all my schooling at the University of Adelaide. I studied philosophy there, did a bachelor's, a master's and a PhD. And um, around my master's, I started to specialize in the philosophy of cognitive science. And so I wrote a master's thesis on um, language comprehension, but the kind of uh, germ of my interest in psychedelics was planted before I ever went to university because I had a long standing interest in meditation and mysticism and these kinds of things uh, from sort of my late teens. And so then just as I was sort of moving from the master's into the PhD, I became aware of the history of psychedelics in psychiatry, the new wave of research, the sorts of experiences and effects that they can induce, and the fact that relatively little has been said about them in academic philosophy. And I thought, well, this is an absolutely fascinating topic, and there just has to be a lot to say here. So that sort of derailed me from the topic I was going to do. I had been planning to do my PhD, again, in philosophy of cognitive science, but in a topic on the nature of mental representation. And instead, I ended up doing this totally wacky sounding topic on psychedelics which is just kind of um yeah led to the the book and all sorts of things um and yeah so after doing the phd at adelaide about a year and a half after that i got the job um at the university of western australia uwa where i'm working at the moment excellent thanks chris um yeah i think that's like all good researchers you start on you know one avenue and then you you know, you hit a road or a block and you go another way, another way, another way. And then you're like, hmm, how do I end up in, in this area or in this, you know, field of study? So I think that's where all good research goes. You just just chase those questions or chase those interests. Um, I got on to Chris uh, a few weeks ago or a few months ago because in one of our episodes, think back on episode six with uh, Dr. Stephen Bright from ECU. I had sat down and spoken to Stephen about some of his research around psychedelics and around the legalization of psychedelics in Australia. And Chris, um, his, Chris's name was mentioned a number of times. And then afterwards, Steve was like, you need to talk to Chris. You need to talk to Chris. With all your like interest in philosophy and history, you need to talk to Chris. So I reached out to Chris because I have an adjunct position at UWA. And then, like I said, I had the, the great privilege of bending his ear for over an hour, where every time he went to go take a bite of food, I was asking him a question, <laughs> which probably was great fun for me, but not much for Chris. He probably went home with indigestion that day. <laughs> it was tremendous fun, as I recall. Um, good conversation and uh, 
good chicken wings is my recollection. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Chris has released his book called The Philosophy of Psychedelics, which we will link into the show notes. But I'm going to um, hand over to Kieran there, who's probably scribbled all over that book uh, a million times because he's been texting me and messaging me how much he loved this book. So Kieran, I'm going to hand over to you and, and you can lead the questions uh, uh, that you have, because I know you have many. We could be here for two days. Yeah, cool. Um, I think uh, a good place to start might be uh, a, a kind of like providing some working definition for key terms and um, for anyone who's not familiar with this because and i know any of the for any of the words i'm about to fire at you or phrases could potentially be entire podcasts on themselves you know like words like what is like a question like what is philosophy what are psychedelics what like what do you mean when you say consciousness but it's not to it's more so to kind of provide some kind of like working definitions so that um, any listeners basically have a kind of an idea of where, where we're coming at, basically where we're coming from. So just to start, um, the book is the philosophy of psychedelics. So f- philosophy, what, what is philosophy? God, maybe you had to maybe start with that one. Philosophy and psychology. <laughs> so and thanks two. very much, Chris. So that's the end of the episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Of the two major terms in the title, psychedelic is by far the easier one to define. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, philosophers are notorious for trying and failing to define things. And um, philosophy itself is one of the things that they kind of repeatedly try and fail to define. But when I tell my students what they're getting into when they take their first philosophy course in first year, or sometimes it might be second or third year, I introduce philosophy as the discipline that kind of aims to expose and scrutinize fundamental or foundational assumptions, right? So the idea is that in virtually every area of human endeavor, there are assumptions that kind of um, seem to be foundational to what we're doing and that what we're doing doesn't make sense without them. But the assumptions themselves don't usually get questioned or scrutinized in the process of that area of endeavor. So, you know, we moralize, we go around making um, moral judgments about various acts. We say that acts are right and wrong, um, courageous and cowardly. We might even uh, make moral judgments about people or things like this. And, And the kind of unquestioned assumption is that, there are certain things that make acts right and wrong, or there are certain things that make people virtuous or vicious or whatever it might be. So that's where philosophy goes. Moral philosophy kind of extracts those unquestioned assumptions and subjects them to scrutiny. In religion, you know, we might practice a religion or participate in it. And if it's a theistic religion, there tends to be this unquestioned or foundational assumption that some kind of God exists. Philosophy of religion then takes that foundational assumption and subjects it to scrutiny. Similarly, in science, you know in the practice of science we have all these assumptions about what knowledge of the world is knowledge of the empirical world and how it's possible and how we can obtain it and what makes some knowledge more reliable than others and again the philosophy of science and epistemology the study of knowledge is devoted to sort of extracting and then kind of critically scrutinizing those foundational assumptions so that's one way to come at it is it's the discipline and in fact that way of understanding what philosophy is is a really useful one if we later get into looking at connections between philosophy and psychedelics um so yeah it's the 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 discipline that is basically devoted to um, exposing, identifying, and critically scrutinizing our foundational, fundamental, often unquestioned assumptions. Um, and it does that essentially with the tools of argument and reason. So, you know, the formulation and the analysis of argument, at least in the so-called analytic tradition of philosophy that I was trained in, is really the philosopher's stock in trade. It's the main kind of tool of the trade. Cool. And psychedelics then? Yeah, this one's easy. Um, so uh, <laughs> the word, uh, you know, uh, simply means mind manifesting or mind revealing or something like that. And it's been applied to many different types of drugs. So the first thing to say is it's not just a synonym for psychoactive. We're not just talking about any drugs that alter the mind, but a specific class of drugs. Now, which class exactly? Some people use psychedelic in a very broad way, and they include things like cannabis and ketamine, MDMA, also known as ecstasy. But it's increasingly common in scientific research to use psychedelic in an even 
narrower sense than that, just to refer to what are sometimes called the classic psychedelics or the serotonergic hallucinogens. So there we're talking about the class of drugs that includes LSD, most famously, psilocybin from magic mushrooms, DMT, dimethyltryptamine, which is an ingredient in ayahuasca, mescaline that's found in various cacti. And what these all have in common, apart from having a very similar sort of profile of effects, is that they all seem to work by essentially the same pharmacological mechanism. They all target this receptor in the brain, the serotonin 2A receptor. Now, they do differ a bit, and some of them hit some other receptors as well, but this seems to be the unified and kind of characteristic of the classic psychedelics, the ones that I focus on, is that their effects on consciousness, on experience, are mainly brought about by, um, yeah, agonist and agonist action at the serotonin 2A receptor. Cool. And you just mentioned that the next one, actually, consciousness. Yeah, yeah, yeah good. The one. really easy one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> I mean, this, this one is important to get right because it's a word that, uh, you know, uh, it does get used in a lot of different ways. And uh, this is something that's been pointed out recently by Matt Johnson at Johns Hopkins, a uh, professor there who works on psychedelics in a, a paper. He's pointed out that if we're going to talk about psychedelics and consciousness, we need to be clear on what we mean by consciousness. So usually when I use that term, what I'm talking about is um, what philosophers call phenomenal consciousness. And this is basically um, synonymous with experience, right? So the idea is that a, a mental state is phenomenally conscious the famous phrase that comes from the philosopher thomas nagel is um, if there's something it's like to be in that state right so we can kind of make the contrast that you know our brains engage in a lot of unconscious information processing right so you know when we kind of hear a sentence in our native language we immediately sort of know whether it's grammatical or not if it's ungrammatical we can hear there's something wrong with it but we don't have any access to how that gets worked out right the processes or the computations that give rise to that process are just outside of our awareness we can't kind of peer inside and see how the brain is actually kind of parsing that sentence and scrutinizing it to see whether it's grammatically well formed or not so that's you know that kind of uh, grammatical processing it's going on it's activity in our mind but it's unconscious it doesn't feel like anything to us whereas you know if we think about the examples that are often given are sort of basic sensory experiences like what it's like to see the redness of a rose or to smell the smell of coffee right what is definitive about these things is there's something it feels like from the inside you know there's something it's like for you to see red um, as opposed to seeing green or blue or seeing nothing at all there's something that it's like for you to smell coffee as opposed to smelling tea or sugar or anything else. So this is really what I'm talking about when I talk about consciousness is just kind of subjective experience. You know, a mental state is conscious if there's something that it's like to be in that state. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, dreaming counts on this definition, right? Even though sometimes we would use the word conscious in a certain sense and we'd say people who are dreaming are unconscious. Well, there's still something it's like for you when you're dreaming, you know, even if you don't remember it later, you're still having experiences. You're still kind of having seeing sights and hearing sounds, even though they might be very weird and incoherent and so on. Whereas on the face of it, this might be true or it might not be, but on the face of it, when you're in deep dreamless sleep, it seems like the lights are not on at all. You're not having any kind of subjective experience then. Um, and yeah, well, that's probably enough for, for consciousness. Yeah, I don't know if that, think, that's think, reasonably clear. Yeah, I think that particular that differentiation you made there between um, the, the different uses of the word in our kind of colloquial grammar where we might say consciousness, but what can confuse people is the idea of being conscious in like a kind of like a descriptive kind of a medical situation as you're trying mm -hmm. to put someone, you're trying to, you're trying to not have someone conscious during surgery, for example. Yeah, yeah. And, and then, but they might be in a dream state while they're whacked out of it on whatever they've been knocked out with. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's that right. Differentiation. Cause there's something, something that I've, and a, a parallel would be something like, I, I've written about this and, and talked about this, which is the use of the word science, for example. Science is could be used in a to describe a method of investigation, like using science to explore, or we could say the science on whatever shows. And that's a, a different thing. One of them is almost a verb, and the other one is a noun or a, a kind of a, 
and it's but it's the same word it's just using two different sentences and the people who kept that can maybe confuse people sometimes I think that's right. I think that particular conflation probably leads to a fair bit of confusion in public discussions of science. Exactly. Yeah. And so follow yeah. the science. Yeah. Whatever follow the doing. science. But that yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. The, yeah, science, yeah. the science is settled. Yes. 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 <laughs> Which <laughs> can by... be a sensible thing to say sometimes, but you need to yeah. understand what it means. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think exactly. by definition, science is never settled, isn't it? <laughs> uh, well, like we'd have we'd have to define settled first, wouldn't we? <laughs> yeah. And here we go down the rabbit yeah. hole of more yeah. stuff. Yeah. So Welcome let's to not philosophy. Be, yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, I'm, that, I, that wasn't on my list, and I'm trying to I'm trying to squeeze the most amount of juice out of Chris here. So uh, you, we should be doing to... of next, right? We've got philosophy. We've got psychedelics. We need to define of. You can if you want. <laughs> I'll pass. <laughs> A derivative, a derivative of the aforementioned. <laughs> so the next one, you actually mentioned it in it. You descri- you started describing like phenomenal experience. You used the word phenomenal. The next one I actually had was phenomenology. Yeah, yeah, good. So phenomenology is a word that, again, has multiple meanings that need to be distinguished clearly. So it refers... Um, originally, as far as I understand it, to a specific tradition in philosophy. So it's part of the so-called continental tradition. So the style of philosophy that developed sort of in the last couple of centuries, the last century or two in continental Europe. And there's a particular tradition there that really emphasizes the detailed investigation and description of the structures of experience. And this is associated with figures like Edmund Husserl, Martin Heidegger, Maurice Merleau-Ponty. This is a tradition that I don't know at all. I haven't studied it, but um, phenomenology, as one of my friends and colleagues, Dr. Heath Williams says, phenomenology with a capital P refers to um, that tradition, that specific tradition that's developed in continental Europe of investigating the structures of experience using a particular method. But the word also gets used these days just for any attempt to study or describe experience, right? Or sometimes it can even get used for experience itself. So we might talk about, you know, the phenomenology of the psychedelic experience. And that can mean just, you know, what the experience itself is actually like, the experiential qualities that it has, or it can also mean any kind of attempt to study or describe that experience and um, describe its structures and qualities and so on. So, Mm. yeah. And, and I, and this, so when I, when I, sorry, yeah, when I use phenomenology in the book, I'm using it in the little p sense just to refer to experience and the description of experience. I'm not getting into the um, continental phenomenology tradition. Yeah. Yeah. And I suppose that, that you mentioned earlier on that you were trained in analytic philosophy and that would be the same thing. It'd be analytic with a capital A, I suppose, in that br- to describe a branch of thinking rather yes. than I'm, I'm trying to be analytic about. I don't know, putting together a piece of IKEA furniture or whatever and read the instructions properly. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do not no, use exactly the word analytical that. with IKEA furniture, care and place. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Look, I tell you what, if uh, skills in analysis made you good at putting together IKEA furniture, I'd be a lot better at it than I am. <laughs> 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 um, the, 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 the common catchphrase in our house any ikea furniture from me is after five minutes i fuck it and walk away from it <laughs> <laughs> you know what i have to say and honestly i'm not on anybody's payroll but i've fallen totally in love with the um, koala this australian company because they make stuff that is like ikea for people who hate ikea they make this flat pack furniture that is just so so easy to assemble it's incredible Really? Koala. We'll have yeah. to check it out. That's our uh, out. new sponsor who doesn't give us any money. There you go. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, they're not giving <laughs> me anything either, except, you know, freedom from all that swearing all and that grief. and all that grief. Yeah. <laughs> Which I think is enough. I'm so grateful to them for that that I'm willing to spruik them every time there's an opportunity. <laughs> every time IKEA comes up in conversation, you say, Yeah. Yeah, yes. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And I think um What's key then, I suppose, is the next one, because at a certain point in the book, uh, you draw, I suppose, uh, before I get on to this, was a core premise and asking you about that in the book. There's a part of the book where you describe, where you write about, I can't remember the, the person who wrote it or the, provided the particular descriptions, but phenomenal certainty versus epistemic justification. Yeah, and yeah. I think that's a really, really, really important concept as it relates to altered states of consciousness and the the 
epistemic ramifications of that and and ramifications of that writ large which i think is the whole premise of your book with the comforting delusion objection and everything but to go into that what is epistemology is the next one so when you when, when we use the word epistemic what's epistemology yeah yeah so epistemology is the branch of philosophy that is concerned with knowledge the study or the theory of knowledge basically and traditionally in uh, you know in the western philosophical tradition it's been regarded as one of the sort of four main branches of philosophy along with uh, metaphysics ethics and logic um so yeah it's basically and again you can see how it fits the model that i described before of what philosophy is right so we go through life thinking that we know some stuff claiming to know things and we say to each other you know oh i don't well as uh, emmanuel macron uh, notoriously said of scott morrison in the last couple of days i don't know if you're following uh, there's no reason why you should be really from oh, ireland but this diplomatic yeah. fiasco between australia and france over these submarines and in the last few days emmanuel macron was asked do you believe or do you think that scott morrison lied to you and he said i don't think he did i know he did um, so <laughs> we do this. We go through life claiming that we know certain things as opposed mm -hmm. to merely believing them. Um, and epistemology is the branch of philosophy that asks, okay, well, what does it mean to know something? Do we really know anything? Do we know the things we think we know? How is it possible to have knowledge? Um, and so epistemology uh, historically has approached those questions from a very theoretical standpoint you know trying to come up with general definitions of what it is to know something and general accounts of how human beings have knowledge but then you can also get into applied epistemology which is closer to what I'm doing in the book where you use the sort of tools and concepts from that that uh, field of philosophy to analyze particular cases where people claim to know something or where we think we might be gaining knowledge or losing knowledge and um, yeah exactly yeah Cool. So um, as an extension of that, then uh, I think the next one, where would be the next one to go to? I think what might also be relevant because it's, it fits in with some of the other kind of key terms and arguments in the book is when we end up, when you say the self, and I know you draw differentiations between narrative and minimal and then I want that, and then you 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 also discuss whether or not it's it's possible, and there maybe controversies around the ideas that a complete dissolution of self is even possible, and the fact that that might be controversial. But before we go on, when you say the self, what 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 do you? I suppose it depends on the context, but could you put everybody a frame around that? Is it because yeah, it potentially yeah. falls into the same category as consciousness, where it depends on the context and the sentence that we're using it in and what we mean. Absolutely. Yes. Self is another one of those really kind of polysemous words, has lots of different meanings. In fact, there's one um, famous paper where the philosopher Galen Strawson sort of rattles off about 26 different uh, theories of the self that he's come across in the, the um, scholarly literature. But the really important thing to distinguish is between the self and the sense of self, right? So when we talk about the self, usually it, it sounds like something kind of esoteric and mysterious, but it's the most down to earth basic thing possible, right? So each of us uh, assumes on some level that we exist, right? And so we draw a distinction between ourselves and all of the things that we sort of stand in some relation to. So we talk about my mind, my body, my thoughts, my feelings, my beliefs, my emotions. And in all of these ways of speaking, there seems to be an implicit assumption. So here we go again, exposing the kind of uh, unquestioned foundational assumptions. There seems to be an implicit assumption that there is something, someone, some entity that thinks the thoughts, that feels the feelings, that experiences the experiences, that kind of owns or inhabits the body or whatever. Now, maybe there is such a thing, maybe there isn't, right? So a number of philosophers and um, traditions have denied or at least seem to deny that there is such a thing as the self. Uh, Buddhism often comes up in this context. But that's what we're talking about, basically. When we talk about the self, we're talking about the thing or the entity, whatever it is, that kind of thinks the thoughts, feels the feelings, has the experiences, etc. So it's whatever 
I am or whatever you are, whatever we refer to with the word I, um, that's what we're talking about when we talk about the self. And so, yeah, some people say there is no such thing. Other people say the self is just the body, right? When we say me, we're just referring to our physical bodies. Other people might say the self is the brain. People who go in for um, a view in philosophy of mind called dualism might say the self is something separate and non-physical that interacts with the brain in some manner. Um, so, you know, that, but that's in general what we're talking about um, without kind of taking a particular stance on whether there is such a thing and if so, what kind of thing it is. But as I said, you've got to distinguish that, the idea of the self itself, uh, from the idea of a sense of self. And when we talk about a sense of self, we're talking about the experience or the feeling of being a self, right? And so the thought is that, well, when I sit here now um, talking to you on this podcast, I am having all these experiences. I'm having visual perceptions of you on my screen and I can see my laptop keyboard and I can hear the sort of distant hum of the air conditioner. I'm sitting here having all these experiences, but not only are the experiences themselves presenting themselves, I have this feeling that I'm kind of sitting somewhere in here having them. You know what I mean? They're being presented to me. They're happening to someone. Now that point the point that it seems like there's someone having the experiences that is a phenomenological point right in other words that is a point about experience i'm not saying there there really is a self i'm just saying it feels like there is a self there is a a selfie type of experience going on right and so that's a distinction that is really crucial to draw in this context between questions about the actual self whether or not there really is any such thing and if there is what kind of thing it is and then on the other hand more sort of phenomenological or psychological questions about the sense of self, the selfie type experience that we seem to have and what mechanisms might underlie that. So I hope that's reasonably clear. Mm. Yeah, we just definitely. sit here all day and do these definitions. This is brilliant. Yeah, yeah. yeah this yeah, is yeah. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I think I mean, we're each one of those definitions. Much, this is pretty much what I sit around and do all day. So so Weird. just 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 a quick question here as Karen gathers gathers his his thoughts and goes on to his next question, Chris. As a philosopher, when you do sit around all day, do you sit around and have those conversations with people, um, in your in your faculty? Do you actually meet and discuss those on a daily basis, or is it something you do as a solo exercise? Oh, I wouldn't say on a daily basis, but it happens reasonably often. Philosophy is definitely highly dialogical it's highly conversational yeah. and often you know yeah you really do benefit i mean we sort of do this thing in a formalized way so right we'll give talks seminar presentations we'll present our works in progress and then get feedback from the audience members on them and engage in kind of um, debate and dialogue yeah. in that setting and that's really really useful for sharpening your ideas developing your views sometimes maybe even changing your mind about stuff um, and then you know we will also kind of, my colleagues and I will talk about these things in a more informal way as well. But that, especially given how specialized things are these days, that tends to be dictated a bit by shared interests. You know, you're more likely yeah. to spend time talking about, because every, everyone, you know, every philosopher has some particular subfield or set of topics that they specialize in. And things are so hyper specialized these days that you don't necessarily know a whole lot about all the areas that all your colleagues are working on, but definitely, yeah, dialogue happens in both formal and informal settings and is a really important part of the process. Yeah. Excellent. Especially because when it comes, when you describe philosophy as trying to unearth uh, assumptions that we might very well be, unaware of the assumptions that we ourselves are making if we are just thinking through something ourselves because there's things you might be taking for granted as axiomatic premises that we might not even realize it until someone else points it out because they're coming from a different axiomatic premise absolutely right yeah yeah and that's that is you know that is one of the reasons why a dialogue is so crucially important because you know we we like to think that we're our own worst critics but in a way we're not we sort of give ourselves a free pass or at least we don't always spot the weak points or the kind of questionable assumptions that our thinking is resting on because yeah they're just the water that we're swimming in especially if they're really really basic to our thinking and our worldview mm. or our identity yeah, indeed. Something I want to ask you about because of your, uh, yeah, I, I won't come around to that yet. So, uh, <laughs> on um, 
the next one then is key to your uh, kind of predictive self-binding idea is to actually just give an overview of a concept which in and of itself once you once you start actually understanding it and for me once i started once i kind of started grappling with it understanding with it, so understanding it a bit more it in itself felt like a psychedelic concept to navigate which is mm. the idea of predictive processing yes so could you could you provide some kind of a, a working description for that as well because when i when i uh, I, I can't help but think of like Neo in the Matrix and this realize that this kind of recognition that it's all a dream, you know? So yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and I agree. It is a highly psychedelic idea. So yes, yeah, so there is this theory that is sort of sweeping um, neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience at the moment, and um, it's getting discussed a lot. It's uh, very controversial, very influential. Um, a lot of people think it's kind of the best candidate we've had so far for a unified theory of what the brain is up to, what it's doing and how it does its thing. And it's based in part on an inversion of traditional ideas about how perception works, right? So the sort of classic picture of how perception works in the brain is that a stimulus comes in through the senses, you know, in the case of vision, it's going to be a signal traveling from the retina and that that then arrives in sort of early areas, you know, it goes in, it's sort of filtered through the thalamus and it comes to the, the cortex and in early sort of areas, early sensory areas of the cortex, there's processing that happens that tries to detect sort of elementary features. And again, in the case of vision, it might be detecting things like light and dark um, lines, edges and things like this. And the thought is that then as that information goes further and further up the sort of cortical processing hierarchy, it gets processed for ever more complicated features, right? So um, first, the early sort of visual areas just detect all the lines and edges and so on. And then higher up, that information gets combined into, well, I can detect a shape there. There's sort of a rectangle there and there's a rectangle there. And then further up, even more complex patterns get um recognized and there's the idea that oh well that's a laptop um, and then further up it gets integrated with information that's coming in through all the different sensory channels into this overall uh, perceptual representation of world that we seem to inhabit right so there's this idea that perception is this bottom-up process a signal comes in through the senses and gets processed as it goes up the uh, the processing hierarchy in increasingly sophisticated ways well, predictive processing turns that on its head and basically says what the brain is always trying to do is to stay one step ahead of the world and predict the input that it's going to get next. And so in order to do that, it does build these complex inner models of the world that have this sort of hierarchical structure. It builds these inner sort of representations of the things that we encounter, um, people, tables, chairs, objects, events, whatever, but it says perception is not this kind of bottom-up process. Instead, it's fundamentally top-down. The process of perception begins with the brain already having expectations or predictions about what's going to happen, and it sends those predictions down and basically compares them against the signal that's actually coming in through the senses. And the idea is this is highly efficient because anything that's predicted correctly, you don't need to process anymore. You already know what's happening. So you can kind of save valuable metabolic resources. You can kind of get, uh, you know, all kinds of biological advantages by saying that, you know, any predicted information, we're going to reinforce the model. We're going to say, yes, yes, that model is a reliable guide to what's going on and don't process the information anymore. So, you know, the philosopher Andy Clark has a good image for this. He says it's like you can imagine a really large, complex, hierarchically structured corporation and you've got all these chains of command and so on. And the busy higher ups say, you know, only tell me the news, right? My time is precious. Don't come in and tell me that the things I expected to happen happened. I want to know about the deviations from my expectations. Um, so that's the idea is it's a way of saving kind of valuable time and resources. Anything you kind of, your model of how the world works already predicted was going to happen is something you don't need to worry about. When you've got a discrepancy, a prediction error, as it's called, that requires some sort of action. And the idea is that when you have a mismatch between expectation and reality um 
depending on a few factors, but generally speaking, that signal will then get propagated up the hierarchy. So it's only the errors that actually get processed. And then the brain sort of has to decide what to do about the error, how to kind of resolve this mismatch between model and reality. And, you know, if the mismatch, well, yeah, depending on the circumstances, there are essentially two things it can do. It can either update the model or it can change the world, right? So, you know, if the model says, uh, there's not a laptop here. And then there's all this prediction error coming in saying, you know, there is a laptop here. Best thing for the brain to do is to update its model and say, well, there's now a laptop there. Easy, no more prediction error. But, you know, if on the other hand, um, the prediction is something like, you know, my, uh, I should be more hydrated than I am, right? You don't necessarily want to just update the model and say, oh, well, I'm dehydrated, nothing to be done about it. A better way to respond to that conflict is to say, well, I'm actually going to change the world and I'm going to drink some liquid, drink some water to then increase my hydration level. So then the discrepancy between expectation and reality is minimized by changing reality, not changing the expectation. Um, so yeah, it gets quite complex when you go into the details of how these decisions are made, but that's basically the idea. Um, and so then the thought, the, the consequence of this that you were alluding to in relation to the matrix is, I mean, I should say this is controversial, like uh, everything about this theory is controversial. And in particular, people disagree about exactly how to interpret it. But one way of interpreting it that I'm very partial to, as you know, from the book is um, the idea that what we experience, our conscious experience of the world is this purely internal sort of virtual reality type thing. And this idea has become associated with the neuroscientist Anil Seth. And um, he puts it in terms of the idea that perception is just controlled hallucination. And this is a sort of phrase that a lot of people get really upset about and you can quibble with it on many levels. But I think the basic idea is very straightforward. It's just that, mm -hmm. you know, when we have conscious experiences experiences that seem to be of a world right in some cases we think those experiences are hallucinatory because they don't actually match what's happening outside of us in some cases we think the experiences are veridical or they're accurate because they do match what's going on outside of us but seth's point is that in either case the experience itself is not the world. The experience is this purely internal thing. It's happening entirely within the nervous system. It's this sort of simulation or virtual reality model of a world that the brain constructs. And so the um, neuroscientist, Antti Ravonsuo, who someone else is, who's into this idea, has this nice phrase. He says, the brain gives us a convincing out of brain experience. It gives us the feeling that we are kind of inhabiting this, uh, you know, world full of people and objects and so on. And of course, the organism is right. The organism really is in an external world. But the idea is that the experience we have of that world is happening entirely within the brain, but it's constructed in such a way that that is not at all apparent. It is precisely a simulation of being this organism in the world that it's in. Oh, that's, I really like that. There was, there was a, I know this is, this is, this, this, there's a concept that Donald Hoffman has of this F fitness beats truth FBT, where there's this kind right. of, where we, we have this, we have this narrow bandwidth of perceptual information that suits us into our evolution, evolutionary niche. And so we're not experiencing reality as it actually is. We're experiencing reality as it would have been evolutionarily useful for our, for our biology to perpetuate. Yes. So like, like we, we can't hear things or smell things that dogs can, et cetera, because we would have had different evolutionary niches to dogs, but yeah. it's the same reality, but there's different capacity to, to experience it depending on what fits an evolutionary niche. Um, Absolutely right. Now, I don't know Hoffman's work well, but from what little I've read, I get the sense that he kind of takes this idea very far, the idea of a disconnect between what we experience and what reality is really like. So I would still want to insist on the idea that, yeah, I mean, our experience is this purely internal model or simulation. And as you say, it's totally selective to the relatively narrow portion of 
things that are, uh, you know, were evolutionarily relevant to us. And there's tons and tons of the world that, you know, we just aren't sensitive to that we don't experience at all. But I would still want to insist on the point that when it comes to those stimuli, those classes of stimuli that are relevant to us, that we do perceive that in the normal course of things, the brain is getting the structure of what's out there roughly right. You know, this is the only way I think you can make sense of the fact that we do manage to navigate around and not bump into things and find nutrients and mates and avoid predators and whatever is that, you know, even if the nature of things, even if we experience the world as being populated by these solid, substantial, separate entities, and there really is no such thing, even if we experience colours, for instance, in a way that is very different from how they really are, still, um, adaptive success seems to me like it requires some basic level of structural accuracy, like you have to be getting the objective shape of things roughly right, in order to achieve those adaptive goals of manoeuvring the organism through the world and getting it where it needs to be. Or else the, the predictive element, the predictive processing wouldn't work. Exactly because, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's because everything right. would just be chaotic anarchy of, of some form and it'd be... Um, when this, and this actually, and also science itself would, wouldn't, wouldn't be so as useful as it was if there wasn't some objective reality independent of whether or not we believe it's true or we That's believe right. it's there. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of people have drawn the analogy between the, the brain, the way the brain is depicted on predictive processing and the way uh, a scientist works, right? The thought is that both are kind of in this business of trying to generate predictions of future observations or in the case of the, the brain future inputs and the thought is that both of them in order to do this create models or theories of the unobservable right they kind of create models or theories of what might underlie the observations or the inputs use those models or theories to generate predictions of future observations future inputs and then when you get a discrepancy something needs to happen there's often a bit of leeway in terms of what actually has to happen right am I going to abandon my theory straight away or am I going to try recalibrating my instruments or you know doing it again more carefully so there's always options and this is a point that's being discussed a lot in the philosophy of science you know when you have a mismatch between a theory's predictions and the actual observations you make there's more than one way you can respond to that but you need to respond to it somehow and a theory or a model that stubbornly keeps giving you the wrong predictions no matter what you do isn't going to last you're going to have to modify it somehow or get a new theory or a new model um, yeah but yeah absolutely right the in both cases it's hard to see how you could get the degree of predictive success that you need to get without somehow latching onto, and this is in, in philosophy of science, this position is called structural realism. It says, look, we don't know really whether our scientific theories about the unobservable world, our theories in physics and so on, are getting it right when they describe the nature of those things, but they've got to at least be mapping the structure of the unobservable realm accurately, because um, otherwise it's very difficult to explain how they manage to uh, make such consistently reliable predictions. Hmm. So, so Chris, yeah. would, it, would it be fair to say in a very simplistic term, this is a bit like machine learning for humans? Yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah, very much in the same ballpark. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So maybe, yeah. maybe we are machines, Karen. Maybe it is the matrix. <laughs> but I think that's why but that maybe if machine learning, for example this is just like chris mentioned there about the parallel between predictive processing and and uh, science and how they work in a kind of like a conceptual structure why they're why they, what that i suppose this is why predictive processing one of the reasons why it strikes me as so um uh engaging and, and appealing an idea is because it maps kind of like structurally onto how science works but science kind of maps onto how biology itself works in from an evolutionary sense, which is almost like science, to use Popperian language, like the scientific generation or the generation of a, cre a, a conjectured explanation is essentially just like whatever random process occurs or process occurs to generate a new mutation. And then that either survives the, the environmental pressures or it doesn't. And then so it, it's like it, it maps on. and But then from even a neuronal level, I may be correct here, incorrect here, but like in a, a book I read uh, last year, um, The Master and His Emissary by Ian McGilchrist, but hemispheric specialization. And in that, he describes uh, how um, 
the brain, when it's even learning and building neuronal connections, it just builds a shitload of them and then cuts away the ones it doesn't need. It doesn't know exactly which neurons to put where exactly, just builds a load of them and then prunes away what's not used. Mm. So then it actually, that's why predictive processing resonates with me so strongly because it maps on at like a fractal level. It, it kind of like the human understanding on a, how our brain actually works maps onto how we scientifically generate knowledge, which maps onto neuronally how we even learn things, which maps onto how biology itself perpetuates across time with evolutionary processes. So like, that's why it, it so, feels so, it feels so um, engaging. It's like, this is something, there's something seriously cool here because just mechanistically it fractally works across all these different levels. Yeah, yeah. And in some of its presentations, predictive processing gets tied to the idea of uh, the free energy principle, which comes from Carl Friston. Carl Friston. Yeah, and that's basically supposed to show that this sort of thing is going to be an imperative of all living systems, right? Living systems, just because of basic biological principles, are going to have to embody an internal statistical model of their environment and operate via these processes of of you know, prediction error minimization. Now, the maths in Friston is just notoriously difficult, and I'm not going to claim to have um, anything like an understanding of the free energy principle, but it is an effort to kind of link these ideas about predictive processing to basic fundamental biological principles and to, to try and show that this sort of processing just flows from basic facts about the nature of living systems. Yeah. And it would make sense conceptually that, what, what the reason it kind of lands in that like a common sense way when when the environment is perpetually in flux like there's one of a phrase that i love and i know ian loves it as well we we're only talking about it recently is that that heraclitus line that you know like no man ever steps in the same river twice for it's never the same river and he's never the same man or, or the buddhist conception of impermanence and that everything is in constant flow everything is in flux that it makes sense when everything is constantly changing the, the, whatever species didn't have a kind of an open source capacity to update its own software or update its own genealogy was going to eventually bump up against uh, some kind of environmental boundary condition and go extinct because it wasn't able to update its software slash hardware across time. So, I mean, yes and no. I mean, of course, we do also see, you know, very simple organisms that seem to operate with highly kind of yeah. stereotyped, yeah. inflexible behavioral routines. But um, yeah, it does. I mean, I'm, I'm no kind of animal biologist. Mm. I'm no ethologist, but it seems like, yeah, flexible kind of open ended learning is yeah. more common than it was once believed to be. But that's, a, uh, that's a very good point of differentiation there, I suppose, with, with something like an amoeba or whatever, looking at, looking at some single cell, they are very different. But I suppose, yeah, that's a very good point of differentiation there between more sim simple organisms and then something like a complex organisms up to a certain point. Yeah. yeah. Um, so with that, I think that, that's, that's kind of like, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a couple other terms that I think might be uh, worth delving into because they kind of set the table for some of your core premises. And one of them is uh, naturalism. So would you, would you mind providing an overview of that? And then also uh, spirituality after that. Yeah, sure. So um, naturalism is, again, one of these words that has dozens of different meanings. Um, but first off, on a basic level, it can refer to either a position, a philosophical view about what exists in the universe, or it can refer to a sort of methodological view about how we should do philosophy and about the relationship of philosophy and science. And in the book, I use it more in the former sense as a view about what exists. And um, in that uh, sense, the slogan version is the natural world is all that exists, right? There's nothing uh, in reality beyond the natural world. And so if you just define it in that way, then obviously the question immediately arises, well, what do you mean the natural world, right? If you're going to say all that there is uh, 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 is natural things, and you have to say what it means for something to be natural. But usually when people uh, adopt this view of naturalism in this, this metaphysical sense, what they have in mind is something like physicalism or materialism, right? So in philosophy of mind, you have these 
different views about the mind body problem, physicalism or materialism, two terms that often get used interchangeably, basically say the mind is purely physical, right? The mind is somehow something that the brain or the body does. Um, it's not anything separate and it's kind of something that has evolved. So reality is fundamentally built of non-minded stuff and minds develop in the same way that life develops. And so you can contrast that with uh, dualism, which says, uh, the mind and the body or the mind and the brain are two fundamentally different things. This comes in different versions, but basically dualism says there's mind, there's matter, and they're fundamentally different. And then idealism uh, is the view that, you know, all of reality is essentially made of mind. Even what looks like kind of mind independent physical matter is still somehow the product of mind or consciousness. So really kind of, you know, uh, rough simplification those are sort of three of the the major views about the mind body problem and naturalism is very close to um, physicalism or materialism right it's the view that yeah the mind is somehow a product or an activity or a function of the brain and body and it typically goes hand in hand with a sort of denial that there are any of what are classically thought of as supernatural entities so like disembodied um, intelligences or disembodied minds, gods, spirits, spiritual realms, anything that kind of transcends the physical material world studied by the sciences. So the intuitive way of kind of defining it is uh, actually in opposition. So you get um, people like the religious scholar Houston Smith, eminent scholar of comparative religion, who took psilocybin um, in uh, psychedelic research back in the 1960s. And he said in one of his books that the basic message of psychedelics is that there is another reality, capital R, that puts this one in the shade. And so this is the kind of idea that in the Western tradition goes all the way back to Plato, the idea that somehow the everyday empirical reality that we inhabit is not the real reality, that there is some transcendent reality behind or above it that eclipses it somehow in uh, value or reality or importance. There is some other dimension or level of reality that is more real or more important than this one. And you can understand naturalism on an intuitive level as basically the denial of that. Uh, naturalism is the view that there is no other transcendent reality, that this reality, everyday, physical, material, empirical reality studied by the natural sciences is the only reality that there is. Mm. And there's a, a reminder of that, that the Spinoza line, Deo Siva Natura, like God or nature. Yeah. Right. And so when you look at some views, it becomes quite ambiguous, right? Some views are very yeah. hard to classify as being yeah. naturalistic or non-naturalistic. Yeah. I don't know Spinoza well, but I'm reliably told that his view is one of them that is very hard yeah. to, to fit into. That's, one, a, of that's, that's one of the things that makes him so en en enigmatic and, and uh, attractive as well. Is But he, I, a, core, a, a core thing with him was he just took it. Some people see him as... Uh, what are they uh, intoxicated with God or whatever was one phrase. And then other people think of him as the first atheist writer, because he, his kind of premise was if we follow, if, if we, if we follow causality all the way back, there needed to be a, there needed to be something that kicked the ball of existence off was his thing. So he's like, his thing was, okay, if anything is God, this is my little small understanding of him. If anything is God, let's say that God is a thing that could kick off the ball of existence. Do you know, whatever was the thing that could bring itself into existence, that was the cause of itself. Let's just say that's God. And after that, everything is God then, because that's the prime mover, let's say. So if, if so, but so, but he, but he was really like, he was a kind of like a, a, in a certain way from my reading as well, like a kind of a no self philosopher, didn't believe in free will, taught that everything was causally connected to previous dominoes that were knocked. Everything happens as a result of whatever happened before it. And this was in the 1600s and they, these, these ideas were like, you know, he, 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 they weren't able to publish his ideas until after he died because he probably would have got his head on a block. But um, right. I'm going to have <laughs> to try to read him seriously one day for a couple of reasons. One is that he gets brought up a lot in relation to the psychedelic experience. People seem yeah. to think that uh, psychedelics and Spinoza are a very good fit. And Peter Shostjet Hughes at Exeter University in the UK is yeah. 
one of these people. He's written a chapter about Spinoza and psychedelics. Uh, but the other one is, you know, as you know, um, Kieran, having read the book, I'm a huge George Eliot fan. I've got three or four epigraphs in there from George Eliot. And it turns out mm. that um, a lot of her philosophical ideas came from Spinoza. She did some of, yeah. I think, maybe some of the first English translations of his works, yeah. or she did some translations of his works. My English. copy of the Spinoza in Ethics is a George Eliot translation. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. there you go. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I'll have um, to tackle him one of these days. He's, he's, on, he's on our list as well. We've been uh, discussing it before. Kieran's been sending me some clips and I've been like, I've been enamored too. It's just, as you know, Chris can't find enough hours in a day to do everything. So it's, oh, it's, in, yeah. it's, in, it's in the list. It's on the shelf. It's uh, <laughs> on the never ending pile. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think uh, these subjects are, are never ending. People think, you know, you get to a certain level and you feel like you've achieved them. As I said, and Kieran and I have discussed as well, it's, the more we research, the more we do. And that's, you know, from my scientific career or doing these podcasts or these chats with Karen or the books I peruse in a bookshop, the, the more I read, the worse it gets. It gets a bit kind of um, nearly like a, the onset of a panic attack some days. <laughs> it's like you start realizing how um, how stupid I really am, you know. <laughs> God, yeah, there's so much yeah. to learn, you know. It's crazy. Absolutely. And I think the the only consolation is just to realize that that, sense of kind of that increasing sense of stupidity and ignorance is yeah. in fact a sign of intellectual progress objectively it does get stronger the more you learn but yeah there's uh, this quote from david foster wallace that i love where i can't remember exactly how it goes but he says you know to try to be informed and literate to try to be really informed and literate today is to resign oneself to feeling stupid nearly all the time or something like <laughs> this and if david foster wallace Wallace said that, then you know, <laughs> I'm happy. <laughs> yeah, I feel like an absolute idiot. <laughs> right. Yep. And proud to proud to feel so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the 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 first question in specific relation to your book that I'd like, I think, is based around the core premise of the comforting delusion objection that you write about, which is um for my kind of reading of your book and uh, it's basically that you've been you've basically put together a fucking tour de force argument or a kind of an, essentially a narrative container to wrap around the strangest things that humans can experience and but in a way that reconciles the experience from a phenomenologic phenomenological sense to a naturalistic scientific worldview so you provided a narrative container around that, that in a certain sense is kind of like a small R religion that's not a big R religion mm. because you've essentially looking at psychedelics as, and this is what's really exciting to me about the psychedelic renaissance, renaissance is, is the acknowledgement of something I've been really interested in for years is that because of my own experiences and the fact that I was raised Catholic, but not really. And like, man, like many, many, many Irish people, basically uh, not even at one point not apatheist but like anti-theist because of all the catholic abuse stuff that went on here and surrounded and like taught like dogmatic anti-religion like anti uh anti-religion of any form and then that was just because of the culture and the thing is surrounded by and then um i'm still not religious in in any formal sense but there is the reality of the, the meaning crisis in the Western world and the, you know, Nietzsche is God shaped or Nietzsche, God is dead. And there's the whole idea of the God shaped hole and the huge, the, the, our, um, in our kind of individual, individualistic atomistic focus and this wrapping up in the material world and material ac ac accumulation of wealth, etc. There's all these things. And it, it's, that's reflected in the, the kind of God shaped hole is reflected in things like suicide rates in developed countries, et cetera, which are, you know, secular developed countries have some very, very high suicide rates, unfortunately. So that's where the kind of this notion of the meaning crisis and the problem that's come along with the absence of people being able to provide a kind of a cosmic justification for their own existence and something that they can latch onto as a North star to orientate off of in very difficult times, the psychedelic Renaissance where it, it is evidence in things like the, 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 the terminal ill cancer patient studies, for example, and people being able to come to terms with their own death and come to terms with the reality of mortality 
And this is re- these are really interesting kind of doorways that are opening up a discussion on the development of a religion that's not a religion, mm. which is what I think you've done with the book is actually provided this container, a narrative container around uh, the phenomenology of existence aided by or spurred on by the absolutely absurd in terms of the how, how powerful it seems to be, the literature on psychedelics. And with that, I, I've been really impressed by your ability to actually separate wheat from chaff and provide these really strong arguments that allow us to deal with things like people's interpretation, like you draw the differentiation between like, um, is it mystical, mystical experience or religious type experience or mystical type? Ex- you draw this differentiation. I can't remember. The, I didn't write down the exact terms, but I suppose I provided all that as a kind of a somewhat wordy um, uh, foundation to basically ask why if, so this is just kind of steel man, the comforting delusion objection a little bit is if someone has an experience in a psychedelic therapy situation or in an unofficial ceremonial situation with whatever in some field, someplace with some shaman people and they end up in a, in a, in a scenario where they have something that is very comforting, but doesn't have strong object epistemic justification. What's, because this seems to be a kind of a core premise of your book. What's the problem there, I suppose, between epistemic justification or the epistemic validity of a, of a, of a belief or a claim or an understanding of reality, and then the fact that the, it may very well be not epistemically justifiable, but it's comforting. So yeah. basically, what's the crack with the comforting delusion objection and where does that fit into naturalism? Yeah, good. Well, first off, thanks for your really kind words about the book. That's a lovely way to describe uh, what I hope I've done there. I mean, I think a lot of people probably think that the container that I've created is overflowing, that there are things that don't fit into it very well, but uh, I've had a go. Um, So, yeah, the comforting delusion objection. So it is this idea Uh, You know, I've taken that phrase from Michael Pollan. He obviously wrote this really famous blockbuster book about psychedelics, How to Change Your Mind. But a few years before that, he published a long form piece in The New Yorker about specifically the use of psychedelic therapy um, for the treatment of depression, anxiety, existential distress in terminally ill patients. And he basically um, interviewed uh, some of the patients and some of the researchers and came away with this picture that essentially people who are distressed because of their impending mortality are being given psychedelics they're having these powerful mystical or mystical type experiences that are causing them to believe fervently and with great conviction in something more in another reality that puts this one in the shade they're maybe gathering the the somehow acquiring this deep experientially backed belief that death is not the end that you know there's part of us uh, deep down that is infinite and eternal and that this is what's underlying the remarkable results we see the kind of uh, reductions in depression and anxiety and things like this and pollen uh, like me thinks that the arguments for naturalism are pretty good that you know it might not be certain but where our best evidence and arguments point is that this is the only world there is there is no other reality that puts this one in the shade And so he says, is psychedelic therapy simply foisting a comforting delusion on the sick and dying? Um, And one of the main responses that someone might make is, well, so what if it is? Who cares? Um, And that's exactly the question you've put. And so it's a question that's hard to answer in a way because we're getting down to fundamental issues of value here, right? So there is uh, a theory. So there's, there's a branch of philosophy that's devoted to theories of value and theories of well-being, right? So trying to systematically determine what are the things that actually matter in themselves or the things that constitute well-being for us that make our lives go well. And um, one theory, of course, is hedonism, that just pleasure and pain or kind of happiness and suffering or just experiential states are the only things that matter, right? And so all it is to have a good life, a life that is going well, is to have 
lots of pleasure and very little pain or to have lots of pleasant experiences and very few unpleasant experiences. That's all that well-being consists in. That's all that the good life amounts to. Now, back in the 70s, the philosopher Robert Nozick came out with this thought experiment that's become very popular and, you know, is kind of, you can see it present in certain scenes in the Matrix and other places in popular culture. And it's called the experience machine. And the idea is that there is this super sophisticated virtual reality machine that you can elect to plug into if you want and it can be programmed to give you the most rich varied satisfying enjoyable simulated life that you could possibly desire i'm not sure if this is in the original um specification or not but some people set it up so that you can sort of have your memory wiped so you won't know that you're in there you know you won't have any idea that you're having a simulated life um, and the question is, should you plug in, right? Would it be a good decision to say, yes, yeah, sign me up. I'll plug into the experience machine and have a wonderful fake life. Um, interestingly, there's a couple of philosophers, um, David Chalmers and David Bourget, who two or three times now uh, have done this big survey. Every few years, they put out a big survey uh, to professional philosophers to try and find out their views on various you know, major philosophical questions. And the results of the latest one came out in just the last two or three days. And it turns out hardly any professional philosophers want to plug into the experience machine. It was um, something like 77% or something said they wouldn't plug in, which I found very interesting. Uh, but so what, what, what's, what's also interesting, Chris, as well, is that just before this episode, I was listening to a podcast discussing this actual thing where Sam Harris and Paul Bloom um, from the University of Toronto are actually going through this exact discussion, exactly what you're talking about. About the experience. Which, yeah. Uh, oh, um, yeah. How okay. do you pronounce his name? Is it Nozick? N-O-Z-I-C-K? Nozick, N-O-Z-I-C-K, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I'm just halfway through the episode. I just stopped before we, it just came out this morning. So it's quite weird that uh, that happened, so... There you go. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's reflected. Yeah, hey? The human the human inclination away from that is actually, if I remember correctly, is actually in the Matrix where one of them, not the, maybe not the first or the, maybe the second or third movie where there's a description that might be the architect character describes to Neo that the initial buildings of the Matrix simulation were done in like a perfectly blissful way. But yes. then the people ended up rebelling and they lost loads of stock was yes. their description or whatever that people weren't having it so they actually had to make it that involved pain and suffering and hunger and sadness they had to put all that into the software in order for people to actually not rebel and to, and to stay in the machine to stay plugged in yeah yeah, yeah but yeah. this so also aligns with like danny hanneman's work as well which is basically about that there's like nearly like a u-shaped curve where you know um people who you know, under you need some amount of pain and suffering. So people who are kind of like rich and never get any pain and suffering and everything has kind of mollycoddled all their life, you know, not very tolerant with pain or solving problems or basically don't have much grit. And then at the other end, there's too much of it. It can kind of, you know, kill people's spirit and, and they can't cope with anything. So there's this kind of U-shaped curve where about getting that exposure um, to some amount of pain and suffering actually stimulates growth within one's life. So there's like a kind of a dose respondent and it's different for everybody depending on different factors and about so, um, reframing problems as well, you know? Yeah, in interestingly, this is built into Buddhist cosmology. So in traditional Buddhist cosmology, they've got the um, six realms of existence, right? And right at the bottom, you've got the hell realm yeah. where it's just un endless pain and torment. Then you've got the hungry ghost or the preta realm where it's just kind of insatiable thirst and desire then you've got the animal realm where you're just kind of stupid then you've got the human realm and then above that you've got the realms of the the gods and the super gods i can't remember what they're exactly called but they say that of the six of them um the human realm is the only one where you can attain enlightenment because basically if you're up in the god realm you're just having too much of a good time you've got no motivation to to develop yourself mm. and then if you're down in the hell realms or any of those you're sort of you're either too stupid or you're suffering too much to to sort of get on with it so the human realm is the perfect balance you've got enough suffering to make you want to you know do something yeah. uh, but not but sufficiently little that you actually can do something as well yeah yeah yeah. So, so, so with the comforting delusion objection, you saying so that the that the basically by ob, by by I suppose by by straining against the notion of comforting delusions, 
that in itself is that there's an assumption being made there that it's preferable to anchor oneself to the most true objective reflection of reality we can. Yeah. And that's, and- that's a premise that we're starting from. And then, but, and, and you've managed, is that what you're, is that what you, that, that, that in itself is like a, a subjective preference to want to anchor toward or orientate toward objective truth. And then that's like a, an axiomatic assumption at the basis of this particular view of. Yeah. I mean, Nozick is trying to show that it's more than just a subjective preference. He wants to show that in some objective sense, it really matters. I mean, but mm-hmm. that, that might take us too far afield because then you have to kind of ask questions about what does it mean for something to, to matter objectively. And then we could yeah. be deep into other areas of philosophy but that's what he's trying to do anyway so the thought experiment is supposed to the experience machine thought experiment is supposed to provide the basis for an argument against hedonism so hedonism says all that matters for well-being for the good life is pleasure and pain Nozick presents this thought experiment and he says look seems to me like you shouldn't plug in hopefully it seems to you as well like you shouldn't plug in let's assume that's the case you shouldn't plug in well why is that it's because even though you'd have lots of pleasure and no pain those aren't the only things that matter truth and knowledge matter as well actually engaging with a real um external world you know objective world outside of oneself and engaging with real autonomous others is also something that is intrinsically important important in its own right and so Mm. you know if somebody isn't um is doesn't kind of buy into that if someone is unmoved by those sorts of considerations i mean in a way they can just close the book i mean if you don't you don't think it matters at all whether it's a comforting delusion or not then why bother? But on the other hand, you know, the comforting delusion objection is a framing device, but it's not all I talk about. You know, I do do a lot of other stuff in the book as well that might be interesting even to people. Yeah. But that's kind of the central uh, concern that all of it is uh, aimed at addressing. And as I say, you know, what I want to show is that the comforting delusion objection ultimately doesn't give us a good reason to um chuck out psychedelic therapy to be seriously worried about it and there are different ways you can come to that same point right so you can say as some people do that there really is a great beyond there really is another reality that puts this one in the shade and then you don't have to worry about the comforting delusion objection or you can say well i think i'm a hedonist i think only pleasure and pain matter we don't have to care that much about truth and knowledge and then you don't have to worry about the comforting delusion objection what i'm trying to show is that even if you don't want to go down either of those roads right even if like me you think naturalism is probably true and you think that truth and knowledge really do matter a lot um you can still respond to the comforting delusion objection still ultimately doesn't give us a compelling reason to avoid psychedelic therapy. Mm. Um, I'm just uh, conscious of time, Karen. So we might just do one more question for Chris and, uh, and then we'll, um, yeah, ho- hopefully he, he's enjoyed this and we can get him back on another time because I, I, I think there's a, uh, there's lots more we could talk about. And just before as Karen's getting selecting his last question, for people listening, I will link in a number of lectures that Chris has on YouTube into this as well, which Chris goes through in, in great detail, the book and his background and, and you know, his, uh, his work. So we didn't want to repeat that in today's session, obviously. So, um, you know, we've got lots of stuff in there that you can go and peruse um, and watch afterwards as well, which are, are quite entertaining as well. Chris is not a dry presenter. It's quite good and interactive. So it is actually, it's fun. So you can watch it on YouTube. They're all there for the Australian Psychedelic Society and and, uh, a few more. So um, with that, Karen, we might just do the the last question for today. Cool. So um, this, and this actually, this is actually in order, the one that I wanted to ask next, but it's also one I think wraps up a lot of what we talked about is that, so to to preface it is um, my most, potent psychedelic experience which may very well be the most potent one is with um five five meo dmt and um in that experience and multiple times throughout the book um you'd reference the data and recent on people on one of the things that correlated with um, less long-term or less beneficial effects across the long term was how difficult the experience was in the in the psychedelic state whereas um, what I was really curious about was, at no, at no point I might have missed something. Did you 
um, kind of elaborate on to, as, to, as to why that might be the case, that the difficulty of the experience went on to potentially be a predictor of how ineffective the experience was going to be in providing beneficial impacts on someone's life. Whereas if I could briefly uh, describe my experience, and, and this actually fits into Spinoza to a certain extent as well, is in short, cutting out all the, any of the prefaces to the whole situation, the actual experience itself that I had once that I've uh, partaken in a, a, a 5-MEO ceremony was it involved the actual memories that I have from it are, no, this is where the self stuff comes in and everything is, no, ex, no memory of having just smoked from a pipe, no memory of being in a ceremony, no awareness of any sense of a previous or a future, just being in initially this, uh, what I've described and, and I've written about it is like a, a terror tunnel or like every bad word I could put on it all at once, ramped up to a billion, ramped up to infinity of badness. That was the worst, ho most horrible, dreadful, terrible experience, comprehensible until, and then, the, and then even the visuals are like these chaotic, swirling patternless mayhem of different shades of gray in these jagged swirly tormented stormy mayhem until the word surrender or the concept of surrender appeared somewhere in conscious awareness so there was no memory of having been partaken of a ceremony of even existing of this is where i find the self stuff so interesting and the controversy around the loss of self because it got me thinking, did I actually experience loss of self? And it's still, I, must, I can look back at my notes, but that's what it, it was like, there was no memory of having existed, existing, being a thing, being separate to this. It was just pure terror, fear, dread, whatever bad words we can use, all of that maximal. And then until the word surrender came, maybe it was from the outside world. Maybe it was the, the facilitators reminding me because it was something that I meditated on for for a period beforehand in preparation, this concept of surrender, this, this deeply meditating on the concept of surrender. And when that term arrived in my, what con that the conscious, the word my doesn't even really make sense. And I'm trying to describe a state in which there wasn't a sense of self, but you know what I mean? The, the conscious awareness that was taking place, the experience, there was a glimmer of something to it. And then eventually grabbing it more and more and more and eventually paradoxically in achieving absolute surrender and giving up all resistance it was like bursting through a membrane and on the other side of the membrane or coming out the other side of the terror tunnel either the terror tunnel washed over me or i went through it i don't know how to describe the the phenomenology of it but it was just fractal geometric patterns made of infinite love that went on forever in every direction. And again, a no memory of having existed, no memory of a past, present, nothing, no sense of time, just a sense of a total dissolution of subject, object, border. Like there was no, I was all of this. This was all of me. There was no, I, there was no, it, there was no, it was just the most, meaningful let's say most real realer than real like you 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 refer to this in the book the most the most real the most impactful the most beneficial the most positive the most beautiful the most low it, all the good words maximal so it was like at the same time and it had an unbelievably potent impact on me this whole experience in the aftermath the integration everything was really beneficial but this particular experience involved at the same time the single worst most awful experience I've ever had and the exact opposite were both part of the same experience. And I came away with this still, I'm at a place where it was the single most important event as a whole in my whole life. And I don't know if the good stuff could have come about without the, what happened beforehand. Maybe it was the contrast, you know, like the 50 cent lyrics, we can't know joy if it wasn't for pain or whatever is that song, you know, and there's lyrics or love wouldn't feel so good if it wasn't for pain or whatever his lyrics were. Maybe it was the contrast. I don't know. But the fact that I had this anecdotal experience of the, of this, of the two of them occurring in the one event. And the fact that this one event was the single most important event of my life. Nothing even is in the same cosmos as it. 
I found it so interesting then to, and this is where this, just as a brief note, this is where the Spinoza concept, um, especially the concept, the, the, the Spinozan concept of nature as one entity, one thing. And if God is anything, it's the whole lot. It's whatever could kick itself off and bring itself into existence. And then the fact that I'm left with nothing but religious language to try and describe this, this feeling of infinite love in every direction and a total acceptance of self, other, it, I, all at once that I'm left using religious language like divine or the Greek word gnosis, like this experiential divinity. I'm left trying to grasp onto, claw onto these, these linguistic symbols to try and articulate it, but the religious linguistic symbols is all that seems to justify or to be, be of use. So that's where Spinoza resonates with me because it's I'm a naturalist in my view that all is nature, but at the same time, I'm left using religious language to try and describe this particular event. So especially so so especially when there's a, a total merger with everything and Spinoza's idea is well, it's all made of the same stuff anyway. It's all made of what he called a capital S substance. So so basically that's a brief one on Spinoza, but the question I suppose I wanted to ask based on that premise, and this is what I found so interesting, is the fact that people, the fact that there was these negative experiences that were correlated, that were correlated to people, that uh, uh, there were more, co- that were correlated with a lack of, I say, less long-term benefit from the psychedelic experience. Is it that there was something inherently limiting to the negative experience in and of itself? Or is it that, the negative experience just made it harder for people to fully surrender, to fully let go, that the negative experience impeded their capacity to fully l- let go of all control and to fully surrender. Um, because that's, I, cause that's what I found. Like when I've read, read the actual literature as well, I'm, I'm like, what is it about the negative experience? Is there something inherently limiting about it? Or is it that it just makes it harder to surrender but, at it, but, but it potentially is, regardless of the experience, possible to fully let go and surrender, which is on the other, which may be on the other side of that. Like in my own personal an- anecdote, is the the loss of self or the or or whatever positive experiences lay on the other side of fully letting go. Because I know that this language of letting go is really key to like Matt Johnson and Johns Hopkins, and they have like is it let go. There's a particular like mantra of like two or three Trust, things. Just let like, go, be open. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Look, great question. And um, thanks for sharing that experience, by the way. That's really um, powerful. Uh, I don't actually have anything that enlightening to say about this. I mean, I was surprised when I first saw those findings because there is this long standing sort of wisdom that even very challenging experiences can be beneficial if they're sort of processed and integrated in the right way. And yet there are a few studies and I'm struggling now to remember exactly what measures they've used. I know there is this challenging experience questionnaire that's been developed in recent years. And then there's also that old um, 5D ASC, five dimensions, altered states of consciousness scale where there's a there's two different subscales. There's like the oceanic boundlessness factor, which is sort of mystical experience, what you're describing by the sounds of it in the, the latter part of your experience. Mm. And then there's a anxious ego dissolution or dread of ego dissolution, which is the dysphoric variety, like the first half of your experience. Um, I can't remember the, the studies that have found difficult experiences to correlate with less benefit. I can't remember if it's sort of one of those scales or the other or a bit of both. Um, I suspect, because I mean, this this kind of general trajectory of having, it's not always so intense, but this general trajectory of having fairly significant sort of fear or anxiety or chaos or whatever in the first part of the experience and then kind of reaching a crescendo, having some moment of surrender, giving up, letting go, that then kind of gives way to, you know, some kind of mystical state or total boundless bliss or whatever. That's quite common, you know. That's a very common sort of pattern that seems to play out. So I would assume that what's going on is something like, I don't know, people rate their experiences as more challenging when they don't have the good bit after or something. Mm. Um, Yeah, and then obviously you're not going to get, it just seems very intuitive, you know, because there is this 
correlation between the mystical type experience, whatever that is, um, and good outcomes. If you don't have that, you're not going to get the same good outcomes. And if people who don't have that, who only have the kind of difficulty without the the you know subsequent peace and bliss, if they are really giving higher scores on the challenging experience scales, then that would explain what's going on. Um, but that's just speculation. Yeah, that's that's kind of all I can think of. Because mm -hmm. yeah, it is certainly true that experiences that have very difficult parts in them can be extremely beneficial i think this is beyond doubt so yeah mm. cool excellent uh we'll leave it there chris thank you very much for your time really appreciate it i have copious amounts of notes here um after that which is always a good uh, a good episode so thanks for giving me more things to read more things to look at <laughs> my <laughs> so pleasure feel... thanks for having me on this has been great <laughs> so as so i can feel oh, more you, man, Chris, uh, if people want to follow your work, um, well, actually, before we we talk about that, Chris's book, The Philosophy of Psychedelics, is out now. Great Christmas present. I think I've ordered video five, people. there it is there, <laughs> five, maybe six copies of it now already. I've sent it around. And oh, more, yeah. thank more, you so much. More going out soon. Um, so it, it's, uh, it's definitely, I think now, after this conversation, I might pick it up tonight and start it tonight and just advance it in the queue. Uh, ahead of my Tyson Fury book, uh, The Great Boxer, there, Karen. Um, Who also has a, a psychedelic connection, interestingly. Tyson Fury. Yeah. Oh, Tyson Fury. Sorry, no, I misunderstood. I thought you were talking about Mike Tyson. Oh, Mike Tyson, yeah. yeah well, interesting yeah. enough, we had uh, Gordon Marino on a couple of weeks ago who's written a book on existentialism, and he's actually friends with Mike Tyson. And when you Google Gordon's book, Mike Tyson is holding up Gordon's book while he's on a plane. So um, there you go, a little link around there. Do yeah, Mike Tyson it? smoked. Mike Tyson smoked uh, five meo on his podcast. He took. He, he was on a podcast with this guy, Doctor Jerry, and then Doctor doc, this guy, Doctor Jerry, and was like, and Mike Tyson was like, "Do you have some with you?" Like Doctor Jerry was like, "Yeah, I do." He's like, "Do you want to do some now?" So then they went out, oh, and really? next thing, and next thing, the podcast comes back on, and Mike Tyson is. He's, he's it's like he's after being in a wind tunnel and there's a big smile on his face and he's sitting there smoking up smoking up a blunt and he's like i love you dr jerry <laughs> <laughs> oh, Kieran, like, pl please send yeah. me that link and we'll put it into the show notes because i, yeah. I want to watch that that's um, i want to yeah. see it too. I, gotta, yeah. I, gotta see I knew, it. I knew yeah. he had smoked five meo but i didn't realize he did it on a podcast <laughs> yeah he did on a podcast they just they literally the podcast goes like they were like yeah, do you, want, do you want to go do it now? He's like, yeah, cool. So then they just put the thing on pause. And then the next thing you hear, fuck, I love you, Dr. Jerry. And he's just smoking <laughs> this joint and he's big, lighting up this huge blunt. And he's just talking about trying to articulate what just happened minutes before Jesus. with this guy. <laughs> Hey, why yeah. isn't your podcast like that? I'm feeling a bit short-changed now, to it be might, honest. It, it, it might be, yeah, Chris. <laughs> 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 wait, till, wait till me and Kieran get together in person. We might. We, it, could, it could get, a, once this pandemic is over, it could get a fucking very funky, very quick. Yeah, it could <laughs> get, get weird, <laughs> yeah. um, So Chris's book is out now. Uh, we'll put it in the show notes. Uh, check it out. We'll put in some lectures there as well. But Chris, if people want to follow your work, maybe get in contact um, how can they contact you? Yeah, I've got a website, um, chrisletherby.com, and it's got my email address on it. It's not a highly professional website, but it does the job. Um, yeah, or just just Google me. My email address is pretty easy to find. Um, yeah, I'm at UWA, University of Western Australia. And uh, Chris, you also do a bit of teaching there as well. Are, can people enroll in your courses? Can they do the unit solo or do they have to be enrolled in an undergrad or as an elective or can people come in and do your courses and particularly online if any international people want to jump on? Uh, we do have some online offerings. Yeah. Best to just sort of have a look on the UWA website and see, uh, you know, what the formalities are there for enrolling in um, philosophy units and that sort of thing. We do have online options since the pandemic. Yeah. So it's possible to do, do some of these courses remotely. Excellent. We'll link those in as well. Mm. There's and some when I, when I as I've been going through your book, Chris. There's uh, and and as I as I uh, think back to podcasts that I've that I've listened to a lot over the years, it's like you, your book, and I can't be more complimentary of it. Is that your book needs to get in the hand of like big podcasts like Tim Ferriss, mm. who's massive investor in psychedelics, Sam Harris, um, 
even the likes of um, uh, Sam or Sam Harris. And there's another guy, Kurt Jai Mungal, who has another big podcast called Theories of Everything. And uh, he's, he's interviewed Carl Friston a number of times, for example, and people like John Verveke, you know, the cognitive neuroscientist in the University of Toronto. So mm. like, I'd actually, because I think that your book, especially with those guys, like the likes of Tim Ferriss and Sam Harris, obviously they, they'd absolutely fucking lap it up if there was any way of getting it into their hands. You know, I think it's it's absolutely fits perfectly with their a lot of the vibe that they have around psychedelics. And I know you reference Sam Harris in the, the spirituality chapter at the back end of your book as well. And the, the, the probably is it the book Waking Up that he wrote, Spirituality Without Religion. Mm. Yeah, so, great book. And yeah, he and I have very similar views on a lot of these topics. So yeah, yeah. Um, maybe get, we should maybe we should each from... mail him a copy and just if he keeps getting enough copies of this book, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, well, I'd that's, absolutely a, that, that's a win-win for Chris because if he doesn't get yeah. on, we end up spending lots of money buying lots of copies. So yeah, you know, yeah. either way, either way, it's a win-win. Very clever. See what book. I did there. That's See it. what I did there. Anyone <laughs> this podcast, if they want, they want to, they need to it, it, try and figure out how to send copies of this book to, to podcasts like Tim Ferriss, Sam Harris, and uh, Kurt Jai Mungle and Joe Rogan. It's a... <laughs> well, you, need get, you need to get. You need to get. You need. We need. You need to get onto your uh, agents at uh, Oxford Press and get them to be lobbying for you. Because yeah, I, I, I think Karen is right. But um, I saying that I have a few connections and so does Karen. We might drop some emails and see what happens. If we can we know mm. we know once removed people from Rogan and a few others. So you know, I'd love to I tell you what I'd love to Karen. Out of all the conversations, I want to hear Chris talk to Jordan Peterson. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah, why yeah, I, yeah. I really want to hear that. And and you know Stephen Blackwood, who was on Jordan's podcast. So maybe we could yeah. uh navigate something anyway we'll see what we can yeah. do we'll let chris uh, go <laughs> and have his dinner and um karen if you just want to hang on the line we'll do some logistics other than that everybody thanks very much for listening and if you're liking the podcast lately please go over to apple and give us uh, 20 stars out of five or any other podcast platforms but more importantly if you do like it please share it with some friends because we're getting some really positive feedback and if you have any comments um, please email us true uh, it's great to get some feedback and ensure we're heading in the right direction with our craziness so we'll see you next time. Peace.